Flawless. Absolutely flawless. Okay, um, where were we? Well, last time we were talking about information. Again, we were talking about information again because we were developing the idea that um, your phenomenal world, the world you live within, the world you experience all the time when you are conscious anyway, uh, is constructed from information generated by your brain. And we looked at the way cortical columns um, act as these information generators, these single functional units, if you like, of the cortex by selecting between either an on state or an off state can generate information. And very large numbers of these columns, which are connected in a very complex fashion, um, can generate very, very large amounts of information. And that this information is um, experienced as your phenomenal world. Now, at this point, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Andrew, you know, this is a bit of a, a leap of faith. You're, you're taking me down here, right? Because you say that the phenomenal world, the world I am experiencing, is, is constructed from information, but it really doesn't seem like that. Um, the world seems a lot more than just information. And that's certainly true. Your world does seem a lot more than information. And, and unfortunately, there's, there's always going to be um, a certain kind of realm of inexplicability about your conscious experience, I think, because you'll notice that throughout this course, I very rarely, actually, I'm second guessing myself, I try to very rarely mention the word consciousness, uh, because it's a very, very slippery subject. And you don't actually need uh, to invoke consciousness as such, or at least an explanation for what consciousness is or where consciousness comes from in order to understand psychedelic drugs. Uh, that will make sense um, later on in this video, where we're going to actually, um, I'm going to try and convince you at least that your world really is constructed from information. And that, that information is constructed by um, your brain. But it is a mystery. It remains something of a mystery, at least to kind of uh, most kind of orthodox neuroscientists. They will often say they understand consciousness or they know where consciousness comes from or that consciousness is somehow generated by the brain, uh, but they don't quite know how yet. Um, but I will, I will openly admit that it remains a mystery for neuroscientists why this you know, why does this pattern of activation of cortical columns uh, have this property of subjectivity? Why, um, when you look at a red apple, that'll do, uh, when you look at a red apple, why does it, why does it have this quality of red? Um, we know which parts of the brain light up, we know which parts of the brain are activated, and we know you know, the kind of which areas the cortical columns are, act, are active when you see a certain color compared to another color. Uh, but we still don't understand why that has this appearance of subjectivity. And I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to get into um, theories of consciousness or theories of mind and that kind of thing. Um, but I will, in this, unit, uh, in this video, uh, try and convince you at least that you don't need to be concerned about that uh, at this point. Uh, you just have to understand that the structure of your world that appears to you uh, is constructed from information. Okay, so what I'm going to do is show you a scene. Uh, it could be uh, a world that you would experience, but obviously we're going to have to use a, a photograph. So this is a photograph that I took on the New York subway. Uh, over the New Year period, and it is admittedly a, a great photograph. Thank you. You're welcome. That's okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, and it's a great photograph, but it's also quite um, useful to illustrate my point here. So when you look at this photograph, you uh, if I asked you to describe this photograph, um, you might instantly say, well, this is the inside of a a train, you might get the clue looking at, um, you know, Manhattan here, that this was a, a, 
the subway in New York and that it was at night and all these kind of thing. You might describe the people. But what I want to do is, is really break down this image into much, much um, lower order pieces. What I mean by that is I want you to break the image down into uh, kind of the most fundamental features possible. So, for example, um, if we were to forget about what you know about the world, obviously you know about uh, faces, you know about people, you know about trains, you know about New York, you know all this kind of higher order stuff, uh, but we want to get really down to the basic features of the world. Um, so, for example, um, we have... Uh, what shall I do this in? Uh, yellow will stand out. Uh, so we've got lines. Right, we've got lines and we've got not just lines, but we've got lines in different orientations. We've got patches of, of color. Uh, we've got shapes, which of course are composed of lines. Um, we've got um, textures. So we've got kind of smooth or mirrored kind of textures here. We've got this curious ruffled kind of texture uh, here. Um, we've got other patches of colour. We've got patches of yellow and also these patches of blue which also has a certain shiny texture to it. Uh, we've got another shape here with another different kind of texture. So we could go on but I think you get the idea that this this world, although it is instantly recognisable to you in its kind of higher order form, uh, can be broken down to um, very, very basic um, features such as lines, colours, textures. And if you were actually on this train when this photograph uh, was taken, uh, movement as well. And it's, it's these very basic features um, that the brain initially is detecting, if you like, or representing. So later on, we will we will look at the kind of the, the higher order. So how do we go from simple features like lines, and how do we convert those or bring lines together to form shapes, and how are they associated then with colors, and uh, how do certain um, groups of shapes um, form what we recognize as faces and, and as people or as hair and, and things like that um, and even you know a train itself. So first of all though we're going to go right back to the fundamental um, most basic constituents of your visual world. Okay so what we were able to do here was take this very complex visual scene, the, the world that you might experience if you're on that subway train in New York, and break it down into its, its basic uh, fundamental features, basic fundamental components, you know, lines uh, in different orientations, um, colors, textures, movement. And this is really what your brain is doing. There are columns uh, that are specialized for representing um, lines in certain orientations. There are columns that are specialized for representing certain colors. There are columns that are specialized in representing movement information. So your brain is constructing this model, um, but it's doing it using these uh, fundamental units. Um, now, later on, um, in one of the later unit, units, we will actually look at how these unit, these very simple fundamental units, you know, lines and colors are actually brought together to form uh, what are called you know, higher order structures. So when you looked at that image, you didn't say, oh, there's some lines and there's some colors. You saw the inside of a train. You saw people. You saw faces. Now, these are represented at a much kind of... Um, a higher level of the cortex, um, so that the cortex actually has this hierarchical structure uh, that we will consider in more detail um, in a later unit. But for this unit, I simply want to emphasize that different cortical columns represent different types of information. We already know how cortical columns generate information, um, um, 
but different cortical columns are specialized to represent different types of information, lines, textures, colors, movement, etc. So I'm going to illustrate uh, with a, a much more simple example. So let's look at an extremely simple case. So here we can see um, a very simple set of features. Now we're going to imagine a extremely simple world where there are only t four possible colors. So we've got yellow, blue, red, and green. And there are also only four possible shapes, squares, circles, no, that's not a circle, getting my shapes mixed up, uh, triangles, that's the, that's the cookie, and the circle and the pentagon, not the pentagon, a pentagon. Um, okay, so this is all the colors and all the shapes that are possible. So then I ask you, well, how might we represent the informational structure of this object here? Well, this is obviously a, um, blue circle, right? So there's two types of information here. There's the color and there is the shape. So what can we do? Well, clear that. Um, we can have four columns. Now, I, again, I must stress this is a highly oversimplified and not really, there's not really a single column in your brain that's, re that, that's responsible for representing the color yellow at all. Uh, but it, it this is purely for explanatory purposes. So we've got a, a column that's specialized for representing the color yellow, one that's specialized for representing the color blue, one for red, one for green, and the same with each of the colors, a square column, a triangle column, a circle column, and a pentacle, pentagon column. So how do we represent that blue circle? Well, straightforwardly, we activate the blue column and we activate the circle column. And just from looking at the, the pattern of activation of these columns, you know that this represents a blue circle. And if this was a realistic represent representation of, of the human brain, uh, then this, this pattern of information, because that's basically what this is, this is a state of activation of these cortical columns that would uh, appear to you as a blue circle. Another very simple example, this is a red square. So this should be pretty obvious to you now that we represent that with, by activating the red column and uh, the square column. Um, so this is another state of the cortex that represents this object, the perceived object, the red square. Okay, so more generally, the cortex is, has court, uh, columns that are functionally specialized to represent different features of the world. And this again is, is obviously a simplified case, uh, but we have here, we have columns that are specialized for representing motion, columns that are specialized for representing color, columns for texture, columns for form, i.e. basically shapes, and a perceived object such as this, um, my avatar, this is a um, this is a little alien face, uh, basically, uh, and there are a number of visual features here. So if we wanted to think about how would the cortex represent the informational structure uh, of this little alien face, well, there's a number of things that, features that obviously need to be represented, right? So you've got, obviously, you've got, you've got shapes, you've got curved lines here and, and here. You've got uh, colors, right? Um, you've got more shapes, you've got... Um, You've got the texture um, of, the, uh, of the face. And we can make it slightly more complicated by adding movement. So uh, rather than just a simple little alien face, this alien face is moving uh, towards the right. So this is how the little alien face would appear to you. This would be the perceived visual object. But of course, the informational structure of this little alien face uh, is a pattern of activation of these cortical columns. So there is, there are columns, or just one column here, unrealistically of course, uh, representing motion. Uh, there's a column here that represents color information, a couple of columns representing form, uh, and a column representing texture. And these form a particular pattern of column activation, a pattern of information that um, is the informational structure of that perceived object. In other words, if this was a realistic 
representation of, of the cortex. This pattern of activation, this pattern of information would appear to you as this perceived object, as that um, little alien face moving to the right. Okay, so we can, we can generalize this to worlds of great complexity. Now, of course, the brain is much more complex than these very, very simple diagrams that I've been showing you. There are many, many, many more columns, uh, and they are uh, in, in interacting, connected with, connected with each other in very, very complex ways. Um, but hopefully it's not too much of a, a mental stretch to understand that even the most complex visual world uh, can be represented uh, as this uh, pattern of activation of cortical columns. Okay. Uh, however, if, um, if you do want to support the production of future courses or you just want to leave a tip, um, then there are virtual tip boxes below. There's PayPal, Ko-fi, Ko whatever it is, even a Bitcoin address if that is your thing. Minimally, please like and subscribe. It really helps me. And please follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you use them, Alien Insect. And I think that's about it. I hope you're enjoying the course. Thank you.